Welcome to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, Episode 2 with Lee Johnson. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, Saul here, back again for the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast. Now for number two, we've got a great guest, I'm really excited about it, Lee Johnson, who's currently the assistant head coach of the Indian national team, also the under-19s head coach of India as well. He's had a great career already, which has taken him over four continents, including being technical director of Rwanda, um, also stints at Crystal Palace and Chelsea in the academies, and he's also worked in America, so he's got lots of knowledge Lots of uh, great stuff to talk about, about development, not only in England and America, but in, in uh, Africa and India as well. So I hope you enjoy it. And also, if you are enjoying the podcast, please do, do leave a review on iTunes. It really does help. Please tell your friends and share as well. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. I hope you enjoy it. So Lee Johnson, thanks very much for joining us. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, can you just give us a little bit of a background about your, your, your journey, your playing and coaching journey up to this point, please? Okay, so um, I started playing football as, as most kids did uh, from the age of about four and five. Um, I, I, I played for Millwall Football Club um, and I was part of their school, school boy programme um, from the age of 10 to the age of 16. Um, I, left, I left Millwall and um, I signed for Graves and Northfleet, um, who are now Epsfleet United, and I was playing for their youth team. And then I played for you know a number of different uh, semi-pro teams, including in, including Gravesend uh, and, and Dartford. Um, but I didn't really you know enjoy the game as much as a player, and uh, I decided that you know coaching is something that I really you know wanted to do and I can remember when I was about 16 uh, my coach at the time asked me you know what do you want to do when you're older and uh, you know I, I said to him you know I'm going to be a football coach um, and I remember his words saying you know it's not easy it's going to be very difficult for you to do that and I was like yeah I know but it's something that you know I would like to to, to work towards so I, I basically focused my attention on um, I'm getting my badges. So when I was 18, I, you know, I took my coaching licences, and uh, my youth team manager at the time, uh, at Gravesend, had a had a small business, and and he also uh, ran their community program, and he was just offering me some part-time work and, and voluntary work, and it was really good for me because you know it kind of laid the foundations um, for me as a coach. It taught me a lot of things and, and how to manage. You know situations and how to manage players and parents um, and the environment that I was working in at the time. So, for like a 17, 18 year old, um, that's very raw, a little bit naive, it's a good experience. And so, it helped me along the road. And uh, I still actually fall back to some of those experiences now because you, you never, you never forget where you come from. Um, so, after I after I started coaching, I got I got my my level two, and I was playing for Dartford at the time. And um, my coach was uh, was Nicky Johns, and uh, he used to play for for Millwall and Charlton. And he he was working at Palace, and he was the manager of the footballing community program. And uh, he offered me an opportunity to work for Crystal Palace as a, a development officer, and you know something I couldn't turn down. So that's where I really started my journey, you know, as a full-time coach. And uh, I was there for five years. Uh, and during that time, you know, I progressed into the academy and started working with the younger age groups as well. So I had like a dual role. Um, and it was a really good experience, you know, working, working in the schools, working, working out in the streets with the local kids, um, you know, seeing, seeing where they come from, understanding the environments that they're in, and I think it shaped, shaped me as a coach because it enabled me to, to adapt 
sorts of situations. Um, and it was something that that was very good for me in terms of my, my development. So then your next, what was your next, uh, excuse just briefly about all your, your guideline and then we'll go back and sort of look at each one in partic- in, uh, in focus as it were. Okay, um, so after, after I left uh, uh, Palace, I, I moved to, to Chelsea and um, I was working in their academy as an age group coach. Um, and again, you know, it's a big club. Uh, at the time, uh, Brandis had just, just bought the club and there was a huge investment. Um, the training ground was being built and there was a lot of money um, being invested to, to the club from, 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 the, uh, from the academy right the way up to the first team. And it was a real good like, time, you know, for me to, you know, to get in and uh, to, to develop as well. So I was there for six years, actually. I left in 2012. Um, but I think that really started, that, that experience there really, really, really helped me working at that higher level, working with some excellent coaches and some fantastic players. And it really kind of, you know, cemented um, you know, my, my knowledge in football uh, and especially like, with player development um, but it was something that I felt you know for me as a coach I, I'd need to move on eventually and um, I had an opportunity to go to to uh, America with the NSCAA and uh, I was asked to, to, to do a session for their coaches convention uh, in 2014 so I flew over there and um, I, I did the session and there was a number of like top coaches, pretty nervous and uh, the session went you know, pretty well and as a result of that I got an opportunity to go to Rwanda and, uh, and become their technical director and, uh, and also uh, the under-17s national team coach. And it was a little bit of a, an unbelievable time because I didn't really expect it or see it coming so um, I flew over there and not knowing really what to expect. Um, so I stayed there for for just over a year or around a year and um, I got offered an opportunity to, to move to India to be the assistant national team coach and uh, the head coach for the under-19s and that's where, that's where I am uh, to this day. Um, so that's my, my little journey so far and you know in coaching. That's, take, that's that little journey's taking you uh, an awful lot of miles, hasn't it? Oh yeah, I've, I've done some air miles, that's for sure. Um, but I wouldn't have it any other way. It's been it's been very good so far. So just so then reflecting back on your time at Palace, your first you know your first role in uh, in academy football, as it were. Just tell us a little bit about that. Your first experiences. You know, what did that look like in practice? Your week. You know, what, what was your feelings about you know being in that uh, that elite environment? So initially, uh, you know, my first role was with the, the community program. So my, my actual job was to develop football in schools and uh, that would be within curriculum time and also uh, after school clubs. So we'd have a set curriculum that we would teach uh, the children. And it was, it was mainly participation based. So it's for boys and girls. Um, and we worked across like three different three different boroughs at the time. So I was working in Croydon, Bromley and, and Sutton. And like I say, it provided me with a really good experience because you know working in, in London and working with some children and, and in some places that you know were very unfamiliar to me at the time it enabled me to, to really develop and like I said earlier at that uh, as as a coach. Um, and you know it, it really helped me for when I moved into the academy um, you know when you're working with academy players they're that much better um, technically they're, they're, they're more advanced um, and tactically they understand the game a little bit better so they challenge you as well and and um, and also the kids are very streetwise especially at Palace the, the players that they recruited um, from the areas of you know Beckenham, Bromley, uh, South Norwood, parts of Croydon, the, the, the lads are very switched on, so they, they will challenge you um, uh, as well. So it, it was it was really good, and you know Palace didn't have the money or, or the investment at the time 
um, like some of the big academies uh, did. And football has obviously changed since back then. You know, like football nowadays, there's a lot more investment in youth football. So we, we actually ran the academy on a limited budget. Um, but I felt that we was quite successful. Um, and, you know, I think some good players that came through at the time. And one of them, I, I, I didn't coach, but he was in the academy at, at, um, at the younger age groups. He was uh, Wayne Routledge. And uh, so when I was there, he was, I think, under 15 or under 16, and he just broken into the first team. And I think that was the start of of a few other players joining and, and following his path. So the, the club's always always managed to produce players, and I just think it's because of the recruitment and the location of where the club is actually based. They're always going to find players. So, you know, it was good for me as a coach, and, uh, you know, I learned a lot, a lot of, uh, of many of the staff there. And, he, and even to this day, I'm still in contact with with one with uh, one of the members of staff, Dave Robertson, who's now who's now the uh, the first team manager of uh, Sligo Rovers, he was at Peterborough uh, last season. Um, so was it was a, it was it always your ambition to get into academy football? I wouldn't say academy straight away. You know, it's like I didn't really set my sights. I didn't really set my sights that far. I just wanted to get involved in football and, and see where it, where it where it took me. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't kind of planning to work in the academies or at an elite level at, at that time because I was only young myself. I was like when I started at Palace, I was 19 years of age, and it was quite an intimidating environment because people that I was working with were either ex-players or had been in the game for a long time. So I was a bit of a I was the baby of the group. So, you know, I had a lot to learn and I had to grow up quite quickly. But as, as I become more confident and as I, you know, we got, got more experience, I just felt that, you know, if an opportunity did come up, then it would be good to work with, you know, with, with better players and, and, and in a better environment. So how did, how did that opportunity come up? What was, the, what was your big break, as it were, to get into that academy? Well, obviously the work that we were doing in the academy, you're exposed to, to a lot and you get to, to know the staff of, of, like, of the academy itself and uh, Dave, Dave Robertson actually, uh, I, you know, I got to know him whilst he was working, I think he was under 14's coach or under 12's coach at the time and then he, he recommended me um, and, and from there I got, a, I got, my, got my opportunity and, it, and it's, it's a big difference, it's such a so such a big jump from from working in the at the community level uh, to working with elite players. Um, there's so much more to think of, and, and uh, in terms of your planning, your preparation of the sessions, and uh, your overall outcomes is is so much so much more different than what it would be if you was working with a group of school kids during a, a curriculum session. Um, so like I say, I, I I got my chance and I was there and. It, it was good. It was good. It was, I think personally, maybe have jumped in a bit too young. I was a bit raw, a little inexperienced, and um, but sometimes you have to do that to, to challenge yourself and, uh, and and take yourself out of a comfort zone, which I was prepared to do. So then you got. Um, so then your next opportunity. What what happened? You made a move across London. Yeah, I made the move across London. Um, so at the time, uh, a good friend of mine that I'd known for many years grew up playing with, uh, Michael Bill, who's now the under-21 coach at Liverpool. Uh, he was working at Chelsea at the time, and uh, he offered me uh, you know, an opportunity to go over there. And again, it's something I couldn't really turn down. You know, Michael, people, people that know Michael, he's a fantastic coach. You know, his knowledge of the game is second to none. And um, was someone that, I'd like, you know, I wanted to work with, and um, and and going over to Chelsea and seeing what they had to offer, and with the investment that was being put into the club at the time, it was it was a really good opportunity for me to develop as a coach. So I started working there with the development centres and with the under eights uh, advanced squad, and then progressed up um, and worked with the under tens and and um, the foundation age groups. Um, and if, if anyone's been or involved in, in academies, you, you know the quality of, of these lads. Uh, they're, they're very, very good. And it was a pleasure to work with them on a, 
you know, on a weekly basis. What would you say are the main were the main differences <clears throat> at that time between Palace and Chelsea in the academies? I think the main thing initially was the money and the investment, the resources that, that Chelsea had. You know, they 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 covered a big area of, of London in terms of how they recruited players. They had I think it was eleven, ten or eleven development centres at the time to recruit. You know, players into uh, that was that was more than any other club, um, and I felt I felt that the way they tried to uh, to develop the players um, was 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 really good. There was an input from from all coaches. It wasn't just your coach and you go and do what you want. No, there was a, there was an actual a remit as such. There was a way of doing things, but he was given a license and a freedom. To, to kind of express yourself and, and put on the sessions that you wanted, but that enabled the players to to learn as well at the same time, um, which was which was really important. Which is, you know, especially especially when when you're working with the young ones, um, you know, six, seven, eight years of age, you know, they're learning, they're learning, they're learning the game, but more importantly, they're learning how to manipulate the ball, and and the focus at Chelsea. At the time, was you know for for that player to be comfortable on the ball. We weren't really interested in in them, you know, making combinations with, with their teammates as such, um, and and doing possession practices or anything like that. They were too young for that. They needed to learn how to to master the ball first. And the the curriculum and the program that that Michael put in place at the time, along with the other academy staff, was was really good for the players and also the rest of the coaches that were involved. So what did that look like in practice though at that time the players trying to master the ball what <clears throat> as you as a coach how do you how do you deliver that in a session? So that the you'd have like a, a six week program and so all of the all of the development centres at the time were were coaching the same theme or the same topic and and so within that you, you would have to put on a session or a practice relating to that theme or a topic. Session would be broken down into three or four parts, uh, fun warm up, uh, technical, um, technical practice, followed by an opposed uh, practice and then a small sided game. Um, and the, the, the technical side of things was really, really important. You'd probably spend a, um, you know, 20, 25 minutes based on that because that's where the players needed the work, um, and then from from that technical uh, exercise or that technical practice, we would then put on an opposed practice relating to what they just worked on, and it might be uh, it might be something that related to a decision making in a one v one or a de decision making in a two v one situation, um, and then what was what was most important was that the players had the opportunity to play. You know, uh, at the end of the session, just play. You know, there wasn't a coaching. Uh, there wasn't. There wasn't no real information given to the lads. It was, you know, go and go and enjoy yourself and and, uh, and show us what you've learned or you know express yourself. So that was the the base and that was the foundation of the of the sessions. And that actually followed in right the way into the academy age groups as well. You know, the the sessions were broken down into to mainly four parts. Um, like I say, the warm up, the technical, the the opposed, and then um, either a small sided game or a, a phase of play, functional practice. So everything had, a, a, you know, had a system and a way of, you know, doing things in order to kind of uh, get the best out of the players. What what's, uh, what's, and what sort of players? Do you remember any players that you worked with that have now come on that people might know that have came through that system that you worked with? Well, um, probably just to the tail end of me just joining um, was Ruben Loftus Cheek, who's now obviously uh, he's in the first team squad. He's doing extremely well. Um, he, you know, he's a great talent as a young boy. He was from not far from 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 where I live personally, and. Uh, actually left at uh, Chelsea who's now at West Ham we signed a pro contract um, central midfield player has done very well there's a few players who's that, that actually, sorry I mean, you broke up a little early who was that you just said 
uh, Declan Declan Rice, okay. um, who's now who's, who was at Chelsea for a number of years, uh, who's now at West Ham, he's done he's doing very well. Um, <clears throat> There's there's a, there's a number of players, but I, I haven't been around to, to see if they're still there or not. But um, you know, it, it was good to see see them and work with them at the time. And um, and the, the good thing is that if they didn't make it at Chelsea, then they've got an opportunity to to stay stay within that environment at another club because they they have they had so much quality and have so much quality that they're able to. To, to, to go to, to most other clubs across the country if they if they wanted to. Okay, so then after Chelsea, your next move is a slightly bigger one. Yeah, so it was a it was a great it was a great opportunity for for me to come up. Um, I remember getting a phone call from from the national team coach at the time, Steve Constantine, um, who I'm currently working with um, in India, and uh, he 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 joined he joined. Um, Rwanda uh, about four three or four months before myself and an opportunity came up a vacancy came up um, to, to be the the national technical director and uh, and I thought he was actually joking around with me at, at the time when, when uh, he asked me if I'd be interested um, and it wasn't like a foregone conclusion where you know they just picked me and I, I got the job it, you know it was a process um, so once I you know, once they, once I found out that they that they wanted to speak to me, and uh, we moved forward, and I got I got my chance. And I have to say, I was very nervous about going over there because I've never been to Africa before. You hear all sorts of horror stories about about you know countries in Africa and, and the problems that that, that uh, go on uh, in that, in the region. And uh, for me, I was, I was a little bit bit nervous about going. And I remember speaking to Steve and. And the general secretary at the time was like, "Well, I feel I'll be safe over there. You know, will I need security? Because, you know, I don't know if many people know this, but Rwanda in '94 had a genocide, and you know, millions of people got got murdered, and um, yeah, and the country was 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 in a, was in a bad way um, back then. And uh, you know, thankfully everything's resolved, and and the country's moved forward, and." I have to say it's probably one of the safest places I've been to um, and one of the nicest places I've been to. So uh, I remember flying out on the plane and uh, I left Gatwick Airport and I was thinking, Lee, what are you doing? <laughs> um, because, you know, you just don't know. You just don't know sometimes. But I think uh, if you really want to develop and, and push yourself, you need, to, you need to do things that other people aren't prepared to do. And I, I felt at the time, uh, it was ready. I was ready to move on and uh, and and take take the take take this opportunity, which which I did. So um, yeah, I, I, I joined I joined Rwanda back in 2014, uh, July 2014. Um, and how did you know? How did Stephen find out about you? How did you make that? Actually, we met in uh, we met in America at the NSCAA convention. He was presenting. Um, you know, on behalf of FIFA at the time, and uh, he come and watch my sessions. Uh, as did a few other people, and as a result of that that uh, that convention, I was offered a few opportunities. Um, but at the time, it just wasn't right for me. And, and me and Steve had stayed in contact. Um, and you know, when that came up for when when that, when that position would become available. Um, you know, he contacted me straight away and thought, right, you know, it'd be good for it, especially with some of the experience I'd had back in England and, um, and what I'd been doing. I felt it'd be a good, good fit for for the country. So, what was your um, what was your role then? Tell, tell us about what was your role at Rwanda. What was your region? <clears throat> so basically, um, my role was to develop football across the country, and it, it focused on like uh, you know key areas, which was uh, grassroots football, um, youth development, women's and girls. Um, coach education and the national teams. So it was a, a big task in, in that sense. Um, the, the national team um, at the time were going through their qualification uh, process for, for the AFCON um, and they were doing really well and, and had some very good results. And um, 
they actually rose from 135th in the world to 64th during during the time that Steve was there, and uh, it was a real, real good boost for football in the country, and uh, you know everyone was on the up. So one of the big things, uh, one of the main main things that I was asked to put in place was um, was the development of youth leagues for for women's. Uh, for, sorry, for boys and, and, and girls. Um, there was no youth football or competitive youth football, let's say. Um, so I looked across the country and the country split into four regions. Um, and um, we looked to try to to set up um, like youth leagues for boys and girls within, within those regions, um, which we actually, which we did. Um, we, we set them up in the market, I think it kicked off in February or the March of 2015, and it was the first uh, one of the first youth leagues uh, in in that region of Africa as well. So it was a real, real good win for me as uh, as a technical director at the time because nothing like that happened in the country. And there's there's so much potential in in Rwanda and and, and many countries in Africa in general, but they just don't get given a chance or the opportunity to to participate in football. Um, like we would in, in England and in other parts of the world. So, you know, we, we focused on three age groups, which was under 13s, 15s and 17s. And um, I think the leagues uh, in total, we had uh, 40, 40 uh, teams in each age group um, across, the, across the country, which, which was really good to start with. You know, and when you're starting something, you know, on a large scale, which is nation nationwide, you have to start, uh, let's say, small, because there's so many people and so many teams and organisations that wanted to get involved. But we, we had to put in a plan where we, you know, started slow and and and, and then grew over time. Um, and and it was a really good, it was a really good, um, it was a really good experience to see to see something like that, you know, start. In, in Rwanda, and was it, uh, how was your uh, how did your previous previous experiences uh, prepare you for that? Did you have those transferable skills? I mean, were these you know how was uh, putting well? I think when you're working when you're working yeah when you're working in uh, in a uh, in a development role, let's say uh, like I was at Crystal Palace, you, you you kind of learn how to kind of to to structure a program in order to develop football and. And then during my time at Palace, I didn't just work in, uh, you know, running schools programs. It was running, um, you know, running uh, street leagues, running, you know, competitions, um, working with special needs kids uh, in disability schools, uh, coach education. So the the, the skills that I learned um, uh, at Palace was something that I was able to fall back on in terms of, you know, setting setting up and uh, developing football in Rwanda um, but the, the, the biggest thing that, that I found that was very very challenging for me uh, at the time was the, the lack of resources that, that were available. We are very blessed in England and I think people forget that. Um, we do have a lot uh, at our disposal. Um, when, you, when you go to a third world country or developing nation and you see, see what they have to Put up with on a daily basis and how they live their lives. Mm-hmm. You realise how lucky you are uh, to have what you have and come from the environment you've come from. So, you know, trying to set up uh, football programs with limited resources um, is very challenging. It's very, very, very hard. You have to use use your networking skills and, and rely on other people as well uh, to to help you. Um, to help you achieve uh, what you need to achieve. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, as a um, as a coach, what did your what did your week look like? Did you, how much time did you actually have on the grass as a, as coaching, or how much and how much was built around this like administration and developing these these sorts of projects? So my my coaching was was uh, limited in the sense that I'd only be working with the national national team when they had fixtures. So. Um, you know, we people that people if people aren't aware. There's uh, international duties that come up throughout the, throughout the year, and there's competitions that are taking place um, in in different uh, confederations, whether that's in in Africa, Asia, 
um, the Americas or, or in Europe. So, so whenever the national teams had had uh, fixtures, then that's when I would be coaching. Um, so most of my time was spent, you know, planning, preparing, uh, and doing more strategic work, um, which which was good. But as the time went on, um, whilst I was in that role, I, I felt to myself that, you know, as much as I'm learning and, and as much as it's a good opportunity, be, good opportunity for me to be doing this, I. I I did miss being away from from the field. I, I miss working with the players on a, a regular basis, and uh, and that's something that I really wanted to to you know work towards and I look to do more in the future. Um, so then your next opportunity came up. Yeah. Um, so basically, how this happened um, uh, again? I think in football sometimes it is it is who you know. Um, and people either people either like that or they don't like that. But sometimes you have to be you have to put yourself uh, in a situation where you get seen or where you get noticed. And um, Stephen, uh, at the time uh, when he was in in Rwanda, we wasn't playing too many matches, um, and he got an opportunity to to go to India. And so he, he left uh, Rwanda and, and uh, moved to India to, to be there to be the head coach of India for his second time actually. Um, and it was just at the time where the ISL, the Indian Super League, was starting. So there was a lot of interest in, in football. Um, again, more money, more investment, and it was it was really a good time for him to, to leave. And that at that stage, and um, once. Uh, once he was there, he, he contacted me and said, look, there might be an opportunity for me to, to bring you over if you're interested. So um, I, I decided to, to take that, that chance and, 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 and go. And uh, I, I, I moved over in, um, in the May of uh, 2015 and uh, I, I joined India to be the assistant national team coach. and. Uh, the head coach for the under 19s. So starting with that under 19s role, uh, tell yep. us a little bit about that in terms of what that looks like in practice. How long did you get to work with the players? Tell us a bit about the planning and prep that goes in towards that role. So, so one of the one of the reasons why I decided to leave Rwanda is because the under 19s in India were part of a national academy in a full time program, um, which is which was something that I was really intrigued by. Um, and, and on a personal level, it meant that I was working with players on a on a daily basis, um, which is something that I really wanted to to do, and that's that's why I moved uh, to India. So uh, the the players were we had 20, 20 we had twenty five players that were part of the under nineteens uh, that had been selected um, um, about three years back, and they would progressed up um, through the age groups. Um, I also had uh, a goalkeeping coach that come from Brazil that ended up working with the senior team as well, which Stephen brought in, um, and a strength conditioning coach and a sports scientist from Australia, who also Stephen brought in uh, to work with the senior team. So the, the staff that was working with the under 19s were the staff that was working with the senior team. So the and, and the reason behind that was that there would be a continuity between players when they progressed up through the age groups, up through into the 23s and, and into, into the senior team, there would be consistency in terms of staff and, and also the players would understand how, how the head coach would like to, to play and, and what his uh, philosophy was on the game. Um, we would run a five day um, training program. Uh, initially, the players were, were training uh, twice a day, and um, and uh, we we sat down with the, the school scientists and the SNC coach, and uh, then came up with a, a program to maximise the, the players' uh, input and outputs and, and their training load um, throughout the week. So that the training would be sometimes split uh, in terms of uh, low, medium. And high intensity training um, that they would that they were doing, and one of the biggest things that we we, we found in India in terms of uh, 
in terms of numbers, if we're looking at GPS, which we were very fortunate to have, um, our numbers were were uh, a lot lower than other nations uh, across the world. And for us, it was really important that we bridge that gap so the players are, are able to compete physically as well as technically and tactically. Um, the boys were fit, but they weren't ready maybe to, to play at international level. Uh, and the, the biggest problem that we faced or, or we face in India is that uh, young players aren't, aren't exposed to football at an early age uh, like like we would you know in England and in, and in Europe and maybe other parts of Asia. Um, you know, education is number one here and obviously cricket is the main sport. Um, so so lads, young lads don't get a, a chance to, to learn the core basics and um, those fundamental skills at an early age. They they, they actually miss that and so by the time they're 16, 17 then they'll be thrust into uh, an elite environment and being asked to compete at an international level and it can be very challenging for them because they haven't some of them haven't got that core foundation you know, which they need in order to to, to play at a uh, certain, certain level and which is something that the, the federation now is really working to improve and over the last two years uh, they've done a fantastic job in introducing like grassroots football and and also like a, like national leagues for for different age groups which is which is good and it's going to give players opportunities to play regular football um, so we were actually uh, in in preparation for uh, the AFC under 19 qualifiers um, and the finals are actually taking place in Qatar um, I think it's Qatar the, in the, this month um, and uh, in our group we were we played uh, Palestine, Afghanistan and uh, the UAE, United Arab Emirates so our, our whole training program um, was, was geared to, to that qualifying process um, and we, we, were, we were very fortunate and able to, to, to play a number of games during, during this period um, I started in the June, we started training in the June and our qualifiers were in the October so we had we had a good two, three months to, to try to prepare the players uh, for that competition um, or for the qualifiers and um, it, it was very interesting because I was quite surprised how technically you know gifted the players were you know they were very capable on the ball um, had lots of lots of energy um, and they understood the game, but at times their decision making um, will let them down, and that's something that we really try to work on uh, and focus on, especially at, at the age uh, that the lads were at. So, what's um, tell us a little bit about the technical and tactical philosophy then of of your in, of India football? Then, what's, what, how does that what does that look like? I think okay. So uh, before I arrived and before Stephen arrived. Um, they, they, they followed the Dutch philosophy here, a uh, 4-3-3 four, 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 three, three system um, and, and all the training for all of the players and even the senior team was, was geared around, uh, around the 4-3-3 the three, three, three philosophy and, and the Dutch way of playing. Um, but I, I don't think necessarily you can, you can say you're going to play this way you're going to play that way. I think it all depends on what type of players you have available to you uh, that enables you to play in a certain way. If you don't have players that can play a 4-3-3 three, three, then why train them in a 4-3-3? Three, three? Uh, and that's the same for any other uh, formation. So um, initially um, we, we started off as a 4-4-2 um, and that was what we were going to focus on. But the players as I said had been used to training and, and, and had, had been used to playing at a 4-3-3. Three, three. So, so I felt that it would be be good for them to to to, to play you know different styles and, and learn uh, learn different formations so they were more adaptable. So if a game was who was playing a game, for example, when we started a four four two, how could we then adapt to a four three three without it affecting us too much? And um, that was something that we tried to try to work on. Um, um, but as I say, I think it's very important that. Uh, that there is a philosophy or a way or a style of play in which 
you know, is followed up through, through the age groups, especially at the, the, you know, the more senior age groups. Um, so like when they're 17, 18, 19, they're becoming young men and they, you know, if they're good enough, they're going to be, you know, introduced into the national team. So if the national team has a, a certain way of playing, um, the younger players need to understand or need to be aware of what to do at a certain time, or what their roles and responsibilities are um, for, for whatever formation that they're, they're being asked to play in. So uh, I, I think it's very important for the young boys and the young players to, to, to play in different formations and, in, and even in different positions. So um, in terms of your sessions then, tell us a bit about like one of your sessions, a typical Lee Johnson <coughs> session with the under-19s there. What does that look like in terms of, you know, the, what do you, do you do technical work is it or gameplay around tactics what's you know what is what's that look like in practice it was a mix of everything you know we were very fortunate to have uh, a very good uh, goalkeeping coach that took, took care of the goalkeepers he, he, he'd worked with a number of national teams he was a professional himself and so the goalkeepers you know were once to one side and, and they worked with him and he he was working on his program and uh we had a strength conditioning coach which doubled up as a sport scientist uh, from Australia and he was in charge of like the players physical performance and in, in injury prevention and so we, we introduced uh, injury prevention um, which was paramount to to us we, we rarely got injured um, you know throughout the training and throughout the games that we played and I think that will come down to to how we prepared before training and and after training and the type of physical work that the boys were doing and as I say we were fortunate again to have a GPS uh, which was in, which enabled us to track you know the players uh, data uh, on a daily basis uh, and it was really good information for us um, to, to help the players understand what they need to do uh, for the position they're playing in and also uh, throughout the games um, and, and in training. So the strength conditioning coach would take the first 20 minutes um, and he would be working on, on a, a number of different exercises and uh, he'd have a set program which he would be working towards, which we'd have agreed at the start of the week. Uh, the players would then come to myself. We would we would do uh, you know we do 10 15 minutes of technical work. It might be uh, just simple passing and receiving, passing and moving, um, individual ball work, group ball work, um, and it then moved on into like small small sided games because at the time I didn't feel the intensity was was where it needed to be. So I'm a firm believer in in playing players learning through play and playing in, in small sided in small sided games um, that with set conditions um, which is something that I, I introduced and then from there we would open it up and either play 11 v 11 or, or go into either a function or a phase depending on what we was working on but everything was related so to start of the day everyone knew that we was what we was working if it was more based around defending the session would would be on, on defending so they, we, we, were, we would never just jump from one topic to the next. It would uh, be something that was continuous right away through. What, what, what would you do if you have, um, you know, you, you identify a player as having an issue, maybe, you know, um, with uh, technical issues, say, for instance, one of the wide players who's had an issue crossing in, mm -hmm. in one of the games. What would you do to approach that within, your, within the team environment? Or does he work on it individually? Or how does that work and practice something like that? I, I think um, a player knows whether he's falling behind or not, or if he's if he's got a weakness that he needs to improve on. Uh, for me, um, I would tend to work on something like that uh, on more of an individual um, basis, um, rather than focus on one individual in in a practice because you have 25 other players to to worry about. So the player needs to be capable. Um, to perform and do what you're asking him to do. So, this is just my opinion. The, the practice would would go during during the session. If I felt that I needed to, to to speak to that individual, then I would do. I'd give him some uh, you know a word of advice or you know uh, ask him to do uh, do something slightly different or maybe change his position. Just 
because I think it's very important for, for us as coaches to give players confidence. The easiest thing is to be critical. You know, if, you, if someone's always telling you what you're doing wrong all the time and, and pinpointing that out and highlighting that issue, it's not going to do your confidence any good at all. Um, so for me as a coach, I try to, to, to give the players the confidence and the freedom to express themselves. And, and if I do feel that they're, they're struggling in a certain area, I, I, will, I will put them maybe to one side and, and just have a little quiet word and, and say, look, this is where I feel that you need to be working on. And this is what we can do to improve that. And we, you know, we did that uh, a number of times with, with the lads. So what, they'll go away after the session and have an individual program or something like that, or just...? No, we would spend maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes just working on uh, on that area of weakness uh, on an individual basis uh, after the session. And that's common amongst uh, football practice across the world. You know, you see players or you hear of players practicing after training. It's just the same, um, but we would be monitoring it and, and helping that individual uh, on, a, on a key area of, of his technical game. Um, and, and we have to be very mindful that if he's had a hard session, you're not gonna, you're not gonna run the lad into the ground or ask him to, 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 to do that exercise too much because he's then potentially at risk of injury. So everything has to be monitored and um, made sure it's the right time and, uh, and the right situation to, to work with that individual. Okay, and just, just uh, we're almost going to wrap up, so I know you're very busy, so just a few a couple more questions. Just briefly tell us about what's it like then playing, you know, assisting with the first team there, an international level? Uh, well, it's That's it's come been... a long way since uh, oh, being in development at Crystal Palace, right? Yeah, you know, I still have to pinch myself because uh, when I think, I've been coaching professionally now full-time since I was 19, I'm 35 now, and I've not just walked into a job, but I've actually started from the ground and worked my way up, and I'm still evolving and learning all the time um, and I'm in this position and, and I would like to continue to develop and if other opportunities come my way uh, then it would be really great for me uh, to continue to stay in the game but for me working with a senior team and working with some of the players that we do have uh, and, and the coaching staff that we have available has been it's been excellent you know, it was, We've we've uh, last last season we was part of a, we started our World Cup qualifying campaign in in Asia, and we played the likes of Iran, Oman, uh, Guam, um, and Turkmenistan. They was in our group, and to see the way they play and the style of football, um, how technical and how tactical that they are, how physical they are, is so different to to how football is in in Europe. So it opened my eyes up a lot. Um, to, to the world of international football and also to travel to these countries because I'd never been to Iran before and um, we, we played them um, we played them earlier this year and to actually go into the stadium and, and to see see some of those players that had played in the World Cup the previous year play against us the football that they played uh, I take my hat to them uh, you know, a very 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 good team some great Great players that have a talk a little you know, bit about there the um, the differences. What are the differences between that than than English football and some of this international <clears> football that you've experienced? I think Asia is very diverse. You know, if you look um, if you look across Asia, you've got like Japan, South Korea, uh, North Korea, um, Philippines, Singapore. Those those countries, the, the the size of some of those players physically is is a lot smaller than a lot of the players in 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 Europe and in other parts of the world. Um, I think that does have a, a big impact. I'm not saying that you have to be big to be a professional or you have to be a big player to be to be playing at the highest level, but but physically some of the some of these teams are a lot smaller and they would struggle. Um, so for example when we played Iran, Iran, most of their players were like six foot plus um, and they they were they were specimens. They could they could get around the field. They were very physically strong. And our boys found it difficult because we can't we can't match them physically. You know, I think our tallest keeper is six foot five, and every every outfield player is either six foot or below. Um, so it's very difficult in that sense physically. 
um, compared to, to Europe. But technically, the players that I've come across can handle the ball really well. Uh, you go to, we played Thailand, we played in Thailand, and um, the players over there are very, very good on the ball and they can, they're great on both feet, they've got good mobility. It's like the Japanese, the Japanese, have, I've watched their under 16s play uh, recently in the AFC under 16 championships. And that was like watching a European team play. The, the technical uh, ability of the, of the players and the way they moved and their agility on the ball and the game understanding reminded me so much of how, how football is played at youth level in, in Europe. But the difference for me was the physical and the mental uh, side of the game. Um, and the, the recent tournament I've just watched, Iran and Iraq were the two finalists in the under-16 Asia Championships. And um, everyone thought that Japan would, uh, would, would step, step, step up and, and, and win the tournament. Physically, they were good, but they wasn't very strong in that sense. They didn't like it when someone gave it back to them and uh, put them under a lot of pressure and took them out of their comfort zone and out of their stride. And, uh, and that's what like Iraq and Iran, uh, they, they did and they did it very, very well. And uh, the, these types of teams, they have that fighting spirit in them. and um, it's very, I, you know, I can, I can appreciate how football is in Europe because there's some, some nations play very physically, some, some nations have that real high work, work ethic and um, intensity, to, intensity to the game. And it's very similar to the likes of Iran and Iraq, but in general across Asia, the technical ability of players is really good. I just think some, some countries that's tactical understanding uh, is, is a little bit behind, but football is improving. You look, know, at, uh, look at someone like time. Spain's success, um, the last generation, you know, the maybe yeah. that not in the, not in the pre, not this current squad, but the squad that had some success recently yeah. they're quite a small squad and yeah. so, i mean they sort of uh, they've evolved they've adapted to play a, a, a style of football which you know their physicality maybe is not the um is not their is not their main uh, one of their main you know strengths Strength. as it were yeah. so do you think that's you know that's the f future for asian football i mean can they adapt can they evolve into a a fighting force that can actually win a major tournament using that you know or is it is physicality always going to be in the way do you think it will have it will have an impact, but you, you take Spain for example. They have in, their players are intelligent. It's a cultural thing, you know. In Spain, football is played all the time. Kids are playing from an early age. It's a cultural thing. In in, in Asia, football isn't and always the number one sport in in, in a lot of countries. Uh, football is shared with with different sports, and and culturally, some players aren't able to play as much as. Uh, we we would do back in England and and in, and in Europe or in South America. So I, I think it's a cultural thing more than more than anything. Um, and the likes of Japan, South Korea, uh, even Uzbekistan, um, China now, Australia. These 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 emerging nations in football are really really trying to implement a good youth development program that enables them to to have a a group of players that continuously will come in through the ranks that will be able to challenge um, for major competitions and major championships in the future. And, and, and I've seen it just recently in the competition uh, that, I, that I've watched. Um, and the football was really, really you know, impressive. And there was a number of scouts from, from Europe that were here watching the players. Um, so I, I think it's more of a cultural thing, but I, didn't, I don't think that just to be, just because you're small, you, you can't make it, or just because you're, you're you don't have that physical size, um, it, you, you're gonna you're not gonna do well in certain games. It's about it's about your players. And if you've got intelligent players that can play and adapt to that situation or adapt to an opponent that is physically bigger and stronger than you, then you've got a good chance of of winning the game. Um, and that's that's the case with the likes of Spain and, and some other countries. But my overall experience so far has been has been really good, and we've we've now qualified for the AFC uh, qualifiers, um, which start in March uh, next year. So we're, we're waiting to find out who's in our group 
I think the draw is made in uh, in January, so look forward to that. So just uh, finally, what advice would you have uh, or give for young aspiring coaches who, you know, looking at your journey now working in international football, for a young coach starting out, what would you give as the, you know, what should they be doing what to increase their chances of being successful? I think one of the biggest things is um, being a good communicator. I think football is all about communicating. Um, we can all put sessions on and practices on, but if you're not giving the players the right information um, and communicating to them in a way that they understand what you want them to do, then I think it's going to be difficult for, for you to progress. So one thing, um, for me, the most important thing is just learning how to communicate with players at all levels um, and different nationalities as well. Because when I went to Rwanda, I had to have a translator. So when I was coaching, I, I found myself shortening my words, shortening my sentences, but using more hand signals, which is things that you know, I would never have really done before because I wasn't used to doing that. And, and I was asking players to, to demonstrate what I wanted them to do, uh, rather than me you know, doing it all the time. So it, it, you, you learn how to find ways to, to communicate uh, to the players. I think that's really important. Uh, for, 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 for you know, young inspire, you know, aspiring coaches to develop. What about your, um, you, talk, you said earlier, maybe it's not what you know when you first start out, you know, that's, I mean, I've you know, had some of those experiences as well, you know, they're, you know, meeting people and them getting to know you and how you work, they open doors. So what do you, you know, what sort of advice would you give for that in terms of getting yourself out there? I think networking is, is key. Um, you know, it's, the world is about networking, whatever industry you're in. It's not just football, it's, it's all different industries. So if you if you know the right people and, and you're networking with the right people, like you just said, doors will open. Um, but what, what I have found is that people will only give you an opportunity if they feel you're capable, if, because they're then gonna put their reputation on the line. And if you're, if you're not to the level that, that you think you are, that you say you are, you can easily get found out. And um, I think you need to be you need to be confident in your own ability. Uh, you need to be patient and understand that not everything comes straight away. You have to work hard. You have to 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 sometimes do the jobs you don't like doing and, and work in the environments you you don't always choose to work in. You know, a cold Saturday morning when it's snowing or freezing rain and really windy, and you're thinking, oh, I could be somewhere else. Sometimes you have to go through that and, 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 and work at a lower level to, to then to, to move up. Um, and that's, that's what helped me and, I, and that's what's helped a, a number of coaches that I've known over the years and, and uh, the journeys are very similar. Um, a colleague so, of mine, um, that he, uh, he said he, had, he was on a course and Tony Carr, the ex- <clears throat> West Ham Academy director was on it and he asked the same question, you know, what advice? And he said, you know, similar to, look, just get your head down and do your job, you know, and only, you know, worry about things that you can control. And, uh, yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's a key, true. right? I think it is true because, like I say, I never had, um, I didn't have a vision of me working in a national, with a national team or working with a national federation um, when I was 18 and 19. I just wanted to coach football. And I just see coaching as a way of doing something that I loved. I don't see it as work. I, I see it more as a hobby. I don't say to someone, I'm going to work now. I just say, I'm going to football. And, and that's something you've got to love what you do as well. If it's, if it's becoming a chore and, and you're not enjoying it, and you're going to sessions thinking, oh, I don't really want to be here today, then it's maybe not for you. We all do have like these down days and where you get frustrated. Uh, and, and that is life, but you know what? You do have to work sometimes from, from the ground up and you do have to put a shift in and learn your apprenticeship and, and learn your trade. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I have, I'm, I'm very aware of coaches that have got their qualifications very quickly and uh, over a number of years, which is fantastic. And they've got a lot of knowledge in terms of, um, of theory and, and in practice and educational level. but. They don't maybe necessarily have the experience to back that up when they really need to. And I think that's the most important thing for me, you know, trying to get as much experience as you can in different environments, working with different people and different players will really help you um, 
evolve and develop as a coach. I think I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, like you said earlier, is that, you know, if you do a good job somewhere, you know, and you're working hard, people notice and that's how, that's the most important sort of networking, isn't it? That word of mouth, that's so people can rely on you. I think, you know, there's a misrepresentation in football sometimes thinking that, you know, it's just, oh, you know, jobs for the boys, oh, he's there. But actually it's about, you know, people need to have confidence in your abilities, you know, if they're going to give you a, give you a job. So knowing that they've seen you work and they've seen you do a good job and you actually, you know, that's a massive part of it, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's like when I went to America to, to do the convention, I, I was really unsure of really whether I wanted to go or not because I'd been to the convention the previous year and and some of the coaches are doing sessions in front of two or three thousand people in the indoor like, halls, indoor arenas. And that's intimidating when you're on a microphone and every word that you say, everything that you do is being watched. And, you know, for me, I was like, do I really want to put myself in this this environment and am I ready for it and I remember flying out there and I practiced my session I knew what I was going to do and I just thought right look you've, you've been doing this all your life or, or all your working life and just believe in yourself and you know your topic you know your subject and, and go and coach and I remember Dick Bate was doing a session next door to me and we finished at the same time and he come up to me and asked me how it went and I said yeah it was good uh, a bit nervous um, this went well, could have done this, you could, but this is, this is how you learn. Not everything's going to be how you plan all the time. You, you, you need to adapt to a situation, to some, to some situations. And, and that's what he said to me. As a coach, you need to learn how to adapt. And as, as, as a result, obviously, uh, of this convention, it opened, it's opened the doors that it has, that it has for me recently. And uh, I am where I am because of that. So finally then, just uh, what advice would you give to a young aspiring player who you know, would like to play you know, top level football? I think you hear it so many times and uh, it's probably a bit of a cliche, but you know, hard work. Um, hard work is, is the most important thing and, and, and practicing, practicing your skills and, and practicing being in love with the football. Um, when I was growing up, that's what we used to do all the time. and. So my generation, we used to go out into the streets, went to the backyard and, and used to play football all the time. And that's where we learn how to play. We don't see that as much now, unfortunately. Um, society's changed. Um, kids are into to different things. But I think if a, if a young player really wants to achieve and, and do well, he needs to, needs to learn how to own the ball and how to love the ball uh, and work on his technical part of the game. Um, and, and then when he is playing, whether it's, you know, for, whether it's for his school team, whether it's for his district or for his club or her club, um, go and enjoy it. And, and if you don't enjoy football, then, then it's, it's not something that you should be really doing. So I just think work hard, practice and enjoy the game. And uh, if you do those things, you've got a good opportunity to, to move forward. Lee, on that note, thanks very much for your insight. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's dynamic ball mastery program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.